I'm Garland Thompson, Media and Program Manager for the Salinas Public Library. These interviews are presented as part of Salinas Stories. The interviews are as recorded and do not necessarily represent the views of the City of Salinas or the Salinas Public Library. For further information, see the City of Salinas Disclosure and Use Policy. My name is Frank Pierce, and I was born in Brawley, California. My mother's side of the family was involved in agriculture going back to 1905, 6. And my great uncle shipped the very first load of cantaloupes out of Imperial Valley, and my grandfather grew a lot of different crops. And in fact, I can remember in 1939, broccoli was being grown on our ranch for man packing. So we have a lot of broccoli history. <laughs> and myself, I was born in 1933 and grew up in Imperial Valley on the ranch a lot of the time, uh, as well as in town, in the city, and I had the good fortune of having a library in town that I could go to, and my goal was to read all of the books in the library, which I just started at one end, not the novels, but the history, the science, and all, and I read books, because that's where the knowledge is that is hidden from us if we go to school. So you come to the library and you'd be surprised what you can learn that will make your life very successful. While I was in high school, I had the good fortune of working for an engineer starting the summer of my freshman year out in the fields doing surveying and land leveling and preparing fields for agricultural production. I continued that all the way through high school and had a short break. Uh, the, I listened to the start of the Korean War and the World War II half-track in the 111th Cavalry down in Brawley and uh, ended up with a stateside accident and was able to go back and finish high school and then on to work, work, work in the engineering field, laying out fields, uh, subdivisions, serving parts and towns of the city. Then I ended up in the Corps of Engineers, drafted, and uh, when the Chinese Communists decided to come south into Korea, then they drafted me and I was trained. Again, I did surveying and all in the Army. I was a uh, reconnaissance sergeant. A lot of helicopter time, checking things out and all. When I got out of the Army, I was married, and I had a child and worked for the city of Tacoma in the Public Works Department, surveying and design engineering. Then went on to the University of the Americas, as it's now known, and then it was in Mexico City. And I have a degree in Latin American history and political science. And while I was there, because of all my surveying knowledge that I had developed, engineering knowledge, I was able to teach archaeological methods on how you lay out your plans and maps and all for your archaeological digs and lost cities, finding lost cities. I worked for the American Museum of Natural History at Comacalco in the uh, state of Tabasco, which is interesting. It's the only city in the New World where they use the sun-baked adobe bricks 2,000 years ago to build it because they didn't have easy access to stone and rock like they did in other parts. I also worked for the uh, Museo Nacional de Mexico at the uh, island of Jaina, 
which we were the first archaeologists to go to Haina. Very interesting there with a lot of figurines and history from 2,000 years ago. Uh, we also had the good fortune of finding a city that nobody had ever seen before that uh, gave me quite a thrill in life that I hadn't expected. I'm out doing surveying, laying out, doing the mapping for the city. I'm out in the jungle going down a trail and this is close to the water and oh, as I start to go down the hill to go across the other side, there's water. I can see that there are deer and all have been going through so I figure I can walk through too. And all of a sudden from the water these two big eyes popped up. This big mouth opened with lots of teeth on it. I turned around and I said, oh, I'm not going. And I looked in back of me now and there was a jaguar tracking me because the two of them were working together to catch whatever got caught and then they'd argue it out. It sounds like some of our political systems were at work. So I had no choice. I had to look that jaguar right in the eye and I took my machete and I told him he was going to be my dinner. And the key to that is you have to be positive when you are in a situation in life that is threatening. You do what you need to do. Your heart will tell you what you have to do. So then from Mexico I returned to the United States and got involved in engineering and again in Imperial Valley, laying out farmland, subdivisions, designing things. And by 1958, I was almost, I was, well actually I was running the engineering operation there because our civil engineer was taking some time off to recover from the high stress of work, so I got it. And one of my projects was with Bud Antle laying out some of their ranches in Blythe. That was my first experience in meeting Bud. And then they hired me in 1959, when I was still working for Newman Engineers, to start laying out the development of Red Rock, Arizona, which is uh, between Tucson, north of Tucson, and at Picacho Peak. I think you can see this picture. And when I started this project, this was mostly desert land. We had some wells that were couple of thousand feet. The interesting thing is that Picacho Peak, right at the base of it, is where they had the farthest west battle of the Civil War, where you had a group of Southerners that were in Arizona that got together and were starting to form their Southern Army, and then they had a bunch from the north that went there, and they had a battle, and I, they found a few of the burials that were left over there one time. I didn't get involved in that. But the interesting thing of this piece of ground, lettuce, Red Rock, Arizona, as we knew it, the production of our very first crop was almost 100% harvested because of the quality of the ground there, not having been farmed. And that's one of the things that you learn in agriculture, whether it's here. If you keep farming the ground, unless you care for it, it loses its productivity. And so that's a very important part of agriculture, is maintaining the quality of the soil. So, after we got started here in 19... Uh, 60, Bud Antle actually, or Bud Hobbs actually suggested that I go to work for them, which I did. I went to work for them in December of 1960, moved to Arizona and was involved at the ranch here, setting up the cooling process, the shipping process, and designing 
the buildings. And a very interesting thing, one of the buildings that we put in there is I dismantled the old packing shed that Bud Antle's father had in Watsonville. And I used the trusses from that. I just shipped them on the railroad down there and reused them to reconstruct a new building. And there's one of the things you learn in engineering in the desert, you have a lot of high velocity winds at times. And so in my design, I took in the consideration of the lift forces that occur when a wind blows over a roof it will lift 30 to 40 pounds per square foot. And that's why buildings blow over, because it can lift them up. And I took into consideration to make sure that that building was there. The other day I was looking in Google Earth, and it's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's uh, where the wooden trusses from the Watsonville shed. Also in 1961, it's when uh, we were first working on developing new harvesting processes. And so I was involved in the design of the uh, wrap machines, actually the wrap tables and all the layout of the machines. The very first machine that we tested out here in the Blanco area was almost like a land plane where you had the big structure and the hanging underneath it and the wheels and it would go this way but of course it makes it very difficult to turn and all. So I developed the concept of the wings that folded out from the machine which had already been done by somebody else for different purposes but actually I set it up so that the wrap tables were there and you could feed the, feed the uh, lettuce after it was wrapped into the boxes were packed on the machine. There was a uh, stitcher on the machine that would actually make the boxes. And then that led to other ideas of, uh, there was this company called Cleanmark that had developed a machine that would glue the boxes rather than staple the boxes. Because you know, if you take a stapled box home and you slide it across your table with staples, it has a habit of getting your wife very angry. So, <laughs> Klemark has tried to develop this machine, but it didn't work uh, for various reasons. So I re-engineered it and that is where I got my first patent here, which is issued in December 13, 1966. This was for the device that would pump apply the pressure to make the glue stick evenly because of the variations in the box. And then this led to using the same concept and practice down in uh, Honduras for the, I uh, went to Honduras and set up uh, machines there in the banana world for gluing the banana boxes because this is when bananas were first being packed in boxes. Uh, and one thing leads to another, to another, to another. Now this was for Bud Antle. For Bud Antle, yes. Bud Antle bought Klemark and so we were running it as a company, Klemark, mm -hmm. and I was I guess the president, I don't know what they called me, but... And also the bananas were... Part of Bud Antle, that was the banana import... No, not then, when I was down in, in the Honduras. No, we had not gotten in the banana business yet. But uh, this was strictly for boxing operations. And so, anyway, there were many changes that occurred in the years as we redesigned equipment to make it more efficient, to, to make it better. And one of the interesting things in 1961, I was back in Washington, D.C., working on the issue of farm labor because we recognized the need to have the women on the machines. 
and for you girls that are listening, you understand that if women are involved, men will do what they're told, when they're told, and how they're told. And if the women aren't there, men have a tendency to goof off play and do things that aren't really productive. And we learned that with women on the machine, productivity was very high because they were always getting the men to get the lettuce up to the machine so they could get it wrapped because we had them on piece rate so they could earn more money the more they produced. It was very successful. So we were trying to set up a, uh, the opportunity for the families that were working to have trailers and then we would set up trailer parks at the different places where we had our thing and keep the families together for positive social gain. So I'm back in Washington, D.C. discussing this with Arthur Goldberg in 1961, who was Secretary of Labor, about this whole concept. And of course, he brought in his Under Secretary of Labor from Texas, and we were going over this concept of being able to structure an environment that was family-centered, that again would allow positive growth of children, families together. But it was decided that we didn't really want these people in the United States. Some of the same thing you're running into today in the Arizona issues. I had discussions and arguments here with uh, Board of Supervisors at that time, and this was when the union issues were starting with uh, Cesar Chavez, who I have also sat across the table from and discussed things with. So the, the real key to this whole historic development was Bud Antle had this ability to envision actually doing things to learn what you couldn't do as well as what you could do. Because if you found out what you couldn't do, you wouldn't go down that path anymore. But until you determined it couldn't be done, it was always be sitting there as a possibility. So a lot of my R&D work that I did, I had a couple of PhDs working on R&D, developing different processes and all, and it was an exciting time. One of the interesting patents that we, that I was able to get as, oh my goodness, let's go back here. Out of all these seven patents, I want to go back to, you no. Know, ah, here it is. This patent was issued on November 25, 1975, and it is for a foam container that we actually developed in the 1960s. It takes sometimes five, six, seven, eight years to get a patent. <laughs> but uh, uh, this foam container, which you saw pictures of, we ended up building these styrene production plants to actually make these containers out of styrene. Again, they didn't weigh anything hardly. Uh, they're waterproof, they cushion the product, and we wrap them with film. Was that here? That was, uh, one plant was here in Salinas and the other plant we had was in Hopedale, California. We also manufactured the foam trays that they used for the transplanting because we were involved in that. Uh, we manufactured uh, for the Polaron Corporation the ice chests. We used to ship those all over the West. They had a big production operation going there. We'd run the plant uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, it was a fairly good production operation. So anyway, that's one of the patents I have. Another interesting patent here is on the, and this one was issued in 1967, it's on the machine that actually made the boxes. 
glued them together. And you could either use it in the plant or out in the field. Well, we had these machines going all over the United States and, of course, uh, other countries, too, where they were making and gluing the boxes in their plants. A lot of the turkey processing plants use this machine for packing their uh, turkey parts in. Okay. So then we went a step farther, and this is a patent issued in uh, March 21st of, well, actually this was before this one, but anyway, this machine actually folded the boxes after they were glued. So then you could take the box out in the field and you could just pop it open and pack your lettuce in it. Uh, I set this up in, uh, also in Guatemala. The Warehouser Company plant was using it there to, to make banana containers. Uh, and this machine and this worked together so that the, the machine glued it and then it fed through this device to end up with these flat containers. So that was... Uh, now, are, what are the containers made of? Uh, cardboard. cardboard. Yeah, cardboard containers. And I had the good fortune of being involved with a lot of the early design of shipping containers of various kinds for a lot of different industries. And uh, had the good fortune of working with uh, Clint Eastwood's father, who was in the container business in those days, on some of our container design. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the opportunities that one has in the produce industry is just amazing the types of things that you can end up developing. Another interesting piece of machinery that we, uh, there's a patent, I have a patent on is, oh my goodness, find it is a piece of machinery that was developed for pineapple coring so that it could be done, a, a person could take a fresh pineapple, feed it into this machine, and the core would come out without all of the skin and everything on it. Uh, there were several of us involved in there. Uh, Don Lanker, who was an engineer here, has a number of different patents on early processes, was involved with this machine. So anyway, the key to, I think, the whole history of our Salinas produce goes beyond just produce. This community, Monterey area, has been so important on the changes in the world, mechanical things. It's hard to believe, but we were building trucks here, the Fabcos were built here, designed and developed here. The, uh, I worked on some of the very early aircraft baggage handling systems that were built here in Salinas. The <laughs> research and all done on developing, improving productivity of different crops, uh, worked on them packaging systems for artichokes, for celery, for lettuce. Uh, and the key, I believe, is when you're a person involved in agriculture, you're always aware of maybe there's a better way of looking at doing this. Maybe we can figure out. And that creates a sense of creativity that can be immediately applied to other things. And I personally think that those of you who are here in Salinas, if you stop watching television and start reading books in the library and using your imagination, you will find that you can make a significant impact on the world societies. Very important. And it comes from the strength of eating and producing vegetables. That was a truly profound statement. Okay, That's with, wonderful, with wonderful that. thought, yeah. That's what our people need to hear here. Oh, absolutely. Need to be reminded of that. All yeah. young, young people, even 
dose of us, but that's sometimes getting a little stale. We can, we can profit by that. Yes, <laughs> my mother, 99, still tells me what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And you're still, you're still working. Um, you told us, you told me a couple things about uh, Salinas that I really didn't, I've always wondered about. You talked about the, um, was it soil contamination? Oh, oh yes. Um, because I know there was a community of people who worked on the railroads here. Yes. But I knew uh, nothing about it. In Chinatown, um, I've done environmental work for the City Redevelopment Agency, all in the redevelopment of Chinatown. And going back to the 1890s, 1900 era, they had a lot of Chinese laundries there. People, that's what they do, is they mm -hmm. laundry. And because it's next to the railroad, and the railroad workers were also living there and all staying overnight, they washed the clothes from the railroad activities, which included the grease and grime and dirt from lubricating all the rail cars and that contained lead, because lead's a great lubricant. When the clothes got washed from the gooey stuff, the water, soap dissolved it, and then it got dumped out on the ground. And so we ended up in the north part of Chinatown, where the garden is now, with very high levels of lead concentration that had to be excavated and disposed of as a hazardous material. Um, we did the same up in Pajaro because, again, they had the Chinese <laughs> laundries up there in Pajaro, and we had to clean up a lot of that also. So one of the things I have learned is that railroad activities from past history, you end up not only with lead, but a lot of arsenic too, high levels of arsenic, because that was used to keep the weeds down. Because if you remember in the old days, those trains running by, there were sparks flying everywhere and we didn't want to have fires so we would maintain the railroad right of ways pretty much clean of weeds and the good control was uh, high levels of arsenic. Now you were showing me on, on this map just briefly what are some of the railroad lines ran in Now this is... This is a 1913 or 1915 uh, USGS map section. And it has, let me move some things around. It has, this is downtown Salinas here. Here is the Alisal slough that wa went through town and the other ditch slough came around here from the uh, Gabalan, or from the Gabalans feeding down Natividad Creek. The railroad at that time went on down to Spreckles and then spread out. Here's the main coast division line of the Southern Pacific Railroad. Then you had a siding that went through here, right on out to over towards Monterey. Uh, and then there were other railroad lines running around too, because that's how that you got a lot of the produce around. Now, a very interesting thing about the Salinas River, I've seen photographs of when Spreckles was being built, that there are ships there, tall ships, because that's how they brought the bricks in. This was before the 1909 earthquake. And the barges used to go up to Gonzales area through there to get the grain to bring down through Moss Landing because well, the entry was through Moss Landing. When the earthquake happened, the ground was shifted and all, and so that's when the Salinas River diverted to go out where it goes now. But you still have the old Salinas River channel that goes between the mouth into Moss Landing. But no, it's, uh, the history of this area is, is quite amazing. You know, one thing that's puzzled me a little bit, maybe you can answer the question, is 
people talk about, well, they had a siding, and this is, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly how that worked, of siding to the agricultural, maybe packing sheds or companies oh, or sure. something, and I, I don't, not being from that kind of background, I, a little, I was trying to envision it. Okay, for instance here, here's the old associated oil company site and the lettuce packing and shipping, whoops, let me turn it around for you. The lettuce packing and shipping, uh, and here's a rail siding that comes down here. Here is a rail siding that goes over to other plants. That's what they mean by a siding, a rail siding that goes to different places. So they were all over. Yes, yeah, because all of this was being shipped. It's market and... This is New Street. Yeah. Uh, here's the uh, tomato cannery here, the pickle, cucumbers, tomato cannery. This map is from 1925. Oh my. I didn't have any idea. I think you have these copies of these maps here in the library, on, probably on microfilm. microfilm. Then here is the growers' ice and development here, the vegetable packing sheds. I, I know I the the maps that we the only map that we have is like um, the eight, eight, eighteen something, mm -hmm. and it just shows the little area of Selena. Mm -hmm. No, these Sanborn maps are available going back all the way to about 1880. Uh, in fact, the matter is, let's go look at 1886. Go! The wind is blowing. So here we have, this is sort of the downtown area of Salinas, and this is where the packing sheds were then that we were just looking at. 1886. 1886. I, had oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, right here. There's sheds and all. Was this for potatoes? This was here, uh, oh, Salinas flour there? mill, where the, of course we were growing grain here, and uh, they were making the flour. Uh, what is that? There's the flour, grain, flour, over at Mill Street. Of course, we have a flour mill. We got a name at Mill Street, don't we? Okay. Mm, let's see. Okay. This one is 1892. It actually tells you where the dwellings are, where what the, what each of the thing. Here's that existing shed over there by the railroad depot. Mm -hmm. Southern Pacific Railroad Stockyard. Of course, 1882, we were still using horses, weren't we? Right there, you gotta have a stockyard. And why would you have a Southern Pacific Stockyard? Well, that's so the horses could move the cars around, right? Okay, now here we are at 1900, same location and all. Southern Pacific Milling Company, Grain Warehouse. Now you said that's still there? Yes, that's a bit historic, that I building. Think that's, yeah, yeah it's, a, it's had a few modifications yes. to it, but yeah. And then here's your Sperry Flower Company Salinas Mill. Which brought the Steinbecks here. Right, then here's the other part of this over here, and here's your railroad depot. And then you can see what's right here. There's a hotel. Oh my goodness. Right there at Palmetto. And then we can move to 1913 and see what changes have occurred. Well, we still have the Southern Pacific Mill Grain Warehouse and what's happening over here? All kinds of new things. Sperry, flour and milling. There's oil tanks and all, and that's what we use these for is to determine where historic uses of hazardous materials may have been occurring, storing, or what have you, so that we can do our checking. Here you have an ice house, offices. Here's the railroad depot again. 
And the, and the freight and passengers was all in one. Yeah, kind of in that one area right there. So anyway, that's just that map. Oh my goodness. From a historic point of view, see, that's how they used to ship bananas. And here's a bananing, banana packing plant in Ecuador, another view of it. Uh, and again, uh, Bonantel had what was known as the Banana Import Corporation. We were shipping bananas from both the Dominican Republic and from uh, Guayaquil, Ecuador. All right, let's see what other points of interest, more bananas, more bananas. Now here is a picture of our plastics production plant. For insulins. That one was, that's the one I think I was doing, yes, this was Hauteville. And this is the, when we built the vacuum tubes in the, for the cooler down at Hopeville. These were the first full car square tubes that I'm aware of that were being built. And I designed these. Uh, and we can see across the top, those are this vacuum lines that were, vacuum was generated by using steam through steam ejectors. Now, are these, were these for railroad cars? Or no, trucks? these are for the load to go, a whole truck load would go in truck. one time, then it would come out. So we were cooling a thousand cartons every cooling cycle about every 20, 25 minutes. So these were stationary? Stationary, right, in the plant. Okay. Now, let's put this away. Do they still use, do they still ship by rail and much at all? No, all no, trucking? no. And that's another interesting thing is when we were switching from rail to piggyback, that was so oh, yes. that, so that the, well, let me take care of that later. So that when, when uh, you would load the trailer, here in Salinas at the cooler, take it right over here to the yard where the, all those rail lines were, and they had this piggyback loading where they just drive these rail cars right up onto the flatbeds. And then they would go east, mm -hmm. then they would unload them, and a local trucker then could deliver them to the different markets. Because originally, almost all of your produce, I need to blow my nose for a minute. I'm allergic to those bananas. <laughs> so, um, see, originally all of your produce went to these big city central markets and then the people would c come in and buy them wholesale and then take them to their stores and all. Well, gradually as you started building your bigger and bigger supermarket locations and distribution centers, then they didn't want that. They wanted the product to come right to their distribution center. So you weren't selling them through the wholesale markets like you were in the 1950s and 1960s, but now you're selling them to individual store distribution centers. So the piggyback would allow that to happen, but still use rail to do the transport. And Bud Andel, we ended up with uh, it's about, I think we had 350 piggyback. That is the 40-foot trailers that you see pulled by the trucks, the refrigerated units. Oh, okay. uh, piggyback. See if I can find a picture for you.
Hmm. I don't have these organized very, very well. It's a standard trailer. It's just that we call them piggyback because they're loaded on a rail car. They're when they're crossing the United States, but you could drive them across the country too. Are they still using them? Now? Well, the same trailers are what you see going up and down the road, but the rail is not. Uh, I don't see them much anymore. They have the containers that they use now without the wheels and the highway. Oh, come on, come on, where are you in here? I know I saw you already oh, once today. Probably we'll have to. Ah, here we go. See, there's... Oh, okay. There is a piggyback trailer. It's a refrigerated trailer unit. And then you see this whole butt of California and all. That was an interesting <laughs> disc. So now, now it's mostly... Trucks, right. Okay, and when would you say those started shifting? Uh, I would say it probably started shifting in the 1970s to more and more truck. And a lot of it had to do, and it's all covered in those videos that, oh, okay. that yeah, it's all covered in that. But the, the, the interesting thing is, is when we first got these, I was trying to order some machinery and equipment from Oakland and I was telling him about, he didn't know who Bud was. And all of a sudden he said, oh, I see all these rail car piggyback units going by that says Bud on it. I said, well, that's ours. Oh, well then, yes, I have no problem selling you this car. Because <laughs> he just saw this whole train load go by with all these cars on it. <laughs> but we had a very interesting to have that Bud label. Mm -hmm. You notice there's a piece of vegetable hanging yes, into it. Yes. We had big discussions and arguments with the Budweiser company because of oh. the Bud. Yeah, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder about that. So if you always look at Bud, you'll see there's a piece of vegetable in it. I was involved well, in the design one of it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so anyway. Um, what, 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 are, what are we get this, talking about? Oh, well, yeah, I was trying to understand when, when it shifted to trucks yeah. and exactly what a piggyback was. Because yeah, it wasn't okay. Sure. Yeah, and you know, interesting things that, that, that I've been involved with is the way that the produce shipping facilities are designed and laid out. And I was the first one that I'm aware of that when we started building the new buildings with the insulated walls and all, um, I had them put the frames on the outside so the inside would be clean and smooth. This was back in the 1980s because I was concerned about the food safety issues of all of these beams and everything collecting dirt. So that was one of my crazy ideas that I see duplicated over and over and over again. <laughs> Oh yes, oh yes, no, I see them. In fact, the irony, when we went to China to go over there, I'm driving between uh, Shanghai and, and uh, Westlake, I'm seeing the foam containers and the things that I was working on over there. Uh, no, I... What's that like for you when you see something like that? No, it's just uh, I, I smile because it's being used. And the irony is, is I can drive almost anywhere in California and see something I've been involved with. Like our, our, our engineer, civil engineer, his first job was doing the detailed drawings for the Bay Bridge. And my former electrical engineer owner he and, and the engineer were the ones that did all these big silos that uh, you see at uh, Spreckles and all over the West. 
we were doing work in cement plants, uh, uh, designing things that they use for cleanup, environmental cleanup. A lot of the work we did, uh, our company, Lee and Pierce, we did for Kaiser refractories. Uh, that the, the key is, is when I talk to young people, I just point out that don't limit yourself with what you learn in school. Get down to the library and start looking at different things so you can find out that your imagination can set the future. You can't do it by sitting there watching sports on television. Yeah, you were telling me about, uh, try to change the subject a little bit, you were telling me about the rubber dam? Yes. Um, when Bob Andel was on the Monterey uh, County Water Resources Agency, we were dealing with this uh, seawater intrusion out in uh, the uh, Castorville area through there. And they were developing this system then to get water from the uh, water pollution cleanup and use it to help uh, irrigate that water. And so then the discussions came up, where else could we get water? Well, in other parts of California, they have these things called rubber dams, which are inflatable dams that when the rain, winter, high water comes, they lower down so the water can get through without being blocked and all. And then when you are put them up, then you can collect the water and use it for irrigation. So we discussed the concept of the present day rubber dam that just started working this year. Uh, gee, I want to say that was back probably uh, seven, eight years ago, maybe more. And um, Bob Antle and was able to get the concept moving to allow us to start addressing the seawater intrusion that's affecting us. Now, what's seawater intrusion coming from? Well pumping the water out of the sea aquifer. The Salinas River, as you know, is an underground river, primarily. And that's a very good book that people should read about the history of Salinas. The Underground River, right here in the library. <laughs> but uh, the majority of the water is in the aquifers underground. Well, if you keep pumping it up, then the water from the ocean starts coming back in to fill the void. And that's where the seawater intrusion comes from. So by reducing the pumping and using water from other sources, then you stop the seawater intrusion that's affecting the wells. And where can somebody look at this rubber dam? You can actually go out and look at it now. Uh, I would talk to somebody from the Monterey County Water Resources Agency mm -hmm. I've taken a lot of pictures of it for them. I do the helicopter flights mm -hmm. for the water agency and for other purposes. And uh, I know that, that young people have had tours out there. And that would be an interesting thing that you may want to talk to the water agency and maybe have a, quote, library tour out there because then you have the Salinas River, Underground River book, and yeah. talk about how and what effect it's had on this area. And then here's a new scientific solution that is addressing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, but no, I always can thank Bob Andel for that one. Well, in, in conclusion, is there anything that you feel that you'd like to add? Well, for, for young people, I would suggest history is an extremely exciting learning process. I personally, from my grade school days in history, had the opportunity to listen to an old gray-haired black man talk about being a slave. He was 12 years old at the Emancipation Proclamation. And Abraham Lincoln, our president then that freed the slaves, shook his hand personally and gave him his freedom. So when I'm talking and listening to that man 
and I shake his hand, that puts one person between me and Abraham Lincoln, which is an exciting historical concept. And that can happen to all of us because we, if we're involved historically, you will be amazed at what you learn and the people you can meet. Except as yourself. 